All right, our next speaker today, uh, it's uh, Keith Ng, and uh, he's gonna talk about uh, a little excitement across the horizon. Keith, whenever you want. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, Eduardo. Um, so yes, <clears throat> today I'll be talking about work I did in collaboration with Chen Zheng and Rob Mann at the University of Waterloo and Yorma Luko at the University of Nottingham. This is work I did in part both at Waterloo and at Nanyang Technological University. And we have an archive paper. So if you have any questions, you feel free to ask via Slack or refer to our archive for more information. So why do we study black holes? <laughs> well, um, as I'm sure many of you have heard by during this meeting all, alone, black holes represent the ultimate limit of our theories of general relativity and quantum mechanics. But our attempts to apply both of these theories to black holes lead to paradoxes, places where these theories disagree. So the idea is resolving these paradoxes might help us reconcile these theories, come up with a new theory that unifies both of these things. That said, though, there are some basic questions about these black holes which haven't been fully answered yet. Questions remain. For example, suppose we drop a particle detector into a black hole. <laughs> what happens? Now, uh, to, to set the ground rules here, we're going to say that the detector falls on a geodesic through the horizon. We're not talking about back reaction. For the purposes of this talk, the trajectory is completely classical. So. Uh, <laughs> we can ask, does this detector detect Hawking radiation particles? A surprisingly subtle question. What happens at the as the detector crosses the horizon? What happens after the detector crosses the horizon? So in this paper, we calculated for the first time the response of a detector falling into the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole and beyond. Now, um, I'm sure most of you will not be surprised to hear that the detector does survive the horizon. There isn't some blast of infinite radiation that happens or something like that. However, there is something going on here. There is a little excitement that does occur at the horizon and we'll be exploring the, I'll present the evidence and then I'll discuss it a little bit at the end. But first, a bit of framework. We're working with the unreduit detector model, a two-like point-like system, two-level point-like system with a gap omega. It's essentially it's an atom. We linearly couple it to a scalar field. This is which it's it's a simplified model, but it captures most of the essential features of the electromagnetic interaction, and it's well, it is easier to work with. Especially since there's a simple expression for the transition probability at leading order in perturbation theory. We get a lambda squared term wh where the pr probability is, lambda is equal to lambda squared multiplied by this detector dependent term multiplied by the, what we call a response function. This response function essentially captures the dependence of the transition probability on the field where we have here the, the time, the proper time, the detector, the coupling constant, the coupling excuse me, the switching function, which determines how the detector switches on and off, and this Whiteman function, which is essentially the two-point correlator of the field state. As for our background metric, we're working with the Schwarzschild black hole, and it's time independent, that is its killing metric is shown here. This is the metric that you might have see, seen quite, quite a bit in undergrad. The met, and as I'm sure a lot of you have heard before, the metric the, there is a singularity in the metric at 2M, but it, it really is only a coordinate singularity. Even though this term goes to, oh dear, <laughs> even though this term goes to infinity and this term goes to zero, and I, I really hope I got that the right way around, there is a way to go around this using singularity, using the Kruskal coordinates. The space-time can be extended beyond the event horizon. So we do that. Using the tortoise coordinate R star as shown up here, we can, set, we can establish the Kruskal coordinates. And if you plot out the conformal diagram, you end up this pretty diagram that again, many of you have probably seen before. 
we have our usual universe in the exterior here, we have the black hole in the interior here, and we have these other two components that I will not be speaking so much about today, but uh, well, they're, they're not in our cause, they're not really in our causal diamond, so we'll, we'll not talk about them very much today. As for this classical trajectory I mentioned, we drop the detector at from rest at infinity. So the critical coordinates with respect to the proper time of the detector to behave like so, or rather with respect to this, this parameter Z where Z is equal to uh, the switching, the proper time of the detector over the horizon crossing time to the one third. And tau is the detector proper time moving in the positive direction from negative infinity to zero. And the horizon crossing time is minus four M over three. <clears throat> so uh, lastly, a, a small technical detail, but an important one, we have the uh, switching function as shown here. We use a, co a cosine force switching function. It's, it has a couple benefits. It's sufficiently smooth to avoid excessive switching noise, we hope. And it also is compactly supported because we don't want to, we don't want to deal with what happens at the singularity. We don't know what happens at the singularity. So our detector should damn well be done for detecting by then. Okay. So there are many more details I could spend an entire hour talking about how we calculated the Whiteman function by summing over mode solutions, the wave equation, harder than it sounds. How we extended the Whiteman past to the horizon by analytically extending these mode solutions using critical coordinates. How we rearrange the response function integrals into a single time integral to calculate the response even more efficiently. But I don't have an hour, so instead I will simply have to refer you to the archive or possibly Slack if, if, if you have a quick question. <laughs> we have an archive, it's great. <clears throat> anyway, graphs, I have graphs. Behold, the detector response with respect to the mean position for three field states. So what we've done here is we take the switching function I showed before and we vary the position up, up. We, we basically vary the switch on switch off time and we plot it here with respect to the median position at which the switching happens. So what you see here is the switching function in three, uh, quantum field states of the black hole, the usual, the Harlow Hawking, the UNRWA, the Boulware. And the Boulware, which represents no radiation coming out of the black hole, it seems to decline a bit when you approach the black hole. And far away from the black hole, it approaches, well, the usual flat space response. Well, the flat space after the finite switching is taken into account, which is the red dotted line. The, un the UNRWA and Hartle Hawking responses though, they seem to have a little peak near the horizon, a small but noticeable peak. As you can see from the axis here, this is not a large effect, but it's on the order of a percent with our parameters. So uh, just to confirm though, everything does seem to be right asymptotically. The UNRU is also approaches the vacuum. The hartle hawking approaches a thermal background as we'd expect. But yeah, we have this weird peak of the horizon here and if we vary with respect to the switching time, like maybe this is a switching noise effect, so we'll switch slower. Well, what happens? Well, what happens is, as you'd expect, the, asymp the asymptotic value of the transition rate goes down because uh, it's, a switching noise. it's switching noise, it goes down, right? But the, we also get this relatively larger signal in near the horizon. The, uh, Excitation, the strength of the excitation near the horizon goes down in absolute terms, but in relative terms, it goes up. So our signal to noise improves the slower we switch. And finally, let's, so what is this? Let's try varying the detector gap instead. So we consider both negative and positive gaps. Uh, negative gap meaning the detector starts in the excited state, of course, and it goes to ground state, whereas positive is the usual ground to excited. And what happens again is this, we see that the response, the response does actually seem to um, become stronger the larger the detector gap is in relative terms at least. Even though in absolute terms the excitation is smaller, the signal to noise does seem to improve as the gap goes larger. And I should comment here that this 
detector gap. If you work it out, it's on the order of 100 times the Hawking temperature. So uh, this, while this is a re clearly related to the black hole vac quantum state, it's not really, I'm not sure you can really call it a Hawking effect per se, Hawking temperature type effect. So to summarize, we have calculated for the first time the response of a detector falling through the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole. As we might have expected, there's no drama per se, but we do find a small local maximum near the event horizon. This isn't entirely unprecedented. Barbado, Barcelo, and Goré in 2011 saw an enhancement in effective temperature near the horizon. And this was discussed further with respect to the equivalence principle by Ben Benjamin et al. in 2019. But well, it, it, as I said, it was an effective temperature approach. There are some questions about how this relates to our, our approach. But our analysis seems to suggest that the excitement is due to superposition of modes of different angular momenta. And to be more precise, if we see, we also saw that this doesn't occur in one plus one D. It seems to be a uniquely three plus one effect. So, but and we'd like to conclude by noting that there are some there are some questions regarding what this quantum what these three canonical quantum states look like beyond the horizon. What the correlation look like? What does it mean? We believe this merits future study. And we'd also like to add that this approach may be applied to other candidate quantum states for black holes you may have heard about. If we have any suggestions, <laughs> feel free to let us know. All right, thank you very much, Keith. That was right in time, perfect, all right. I've got a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the first one, maybe I missed it during the, your talk. The, the peak that you see near the horizon, it does not seem to be on the horizon, it seems to be just a little bit inside the horizon. Is that mm, right? It's, that's true. Yes, that is something we were wondering about ourselves. It's not perfectly centered on the horizon. Um, so it's at the, do you know how far away from the horizon it is? At, at what, uh, well, the, the, the tricky radius? part is, the graph goes, the graph is plotted according to median radius r, right? But things aren't. But of course, the velocity of the detector respect to, oh, where is it? Let's see if you I can. You can share screen. You can share screen okay. to show the slides if you want, yeah. God damn, why is this have to be so hard? Yeah, so the peak is slightly behind the horizon. I, I'm not sure if we tried to pinpoint the exact maximum very hard because unfortunately there, well, there isn't so much, we don't fully understand the state, the nature of these quantum states beyond the horizon. So that, that radius is, you know, it's, if you vary the different parameters like the, window function and so on, that radius is always, does not vary? Like, it, I mean, I'm not, it's well, a little um, Actually, here. it does seem to vary a little here, for example, if you, um, this is the this is the plot where we varied the detector gap. And as you can see, the trough actually is a little in head of the horizon if the detector is um, negative gapped. So it starts excited, then it de-excites. So that is something we could look into in the future, I suppose. Uh, I mean, can, I venture, uh, can I venture a conjecture? I don't know if it's true that I cannot see it in the plot, but you see, I mean, there's a, is it, does it get closer to the horizon, the larger the gap or not? I guess that if the answer is no, then I won't even. Um, the, the lar like the negative larger gap, well, there's only, <laughs> there's only four gaps here on this graph, but. Right. But the more negative it becomes, the closer it seems to be getting to the horizon, at least. And, and it seems similar for the positive. So my, 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 my idea would be, so what the conjecture would be, it takes a while for a detector, the internal degree of spin of the detector may take a while to realize where they are. Yes. Uh, they have to probe the field and uh, the internal dynamics is the time resolution. They have to figure it out. So it may be, you know, uh, not realizing where it is, if you want, for very low gap yet. So it may be faster detectors that realize where they are and what's going on faster. That might be it. So Perhaps. maybe, um, I mean, again, conjecture. 
Mark, yeah, I, was I, mean, also, I was also reminded that your group did the uh, commutator black hole stuff, right? Yeah, we're, so the, you mean the, as, as far as, yeah, we have a, so Mark, uh, uh, Robert Johnson, Ahim and I, uh, you mean, we have, uh, we've uh, done quantum communication in, in Svarsil 3 plus 1, and Robert Johnson is going to talk about harvesting, which we also have results, not on our Okay, category. okay. So st st stick around for Rob's, uh, Rob's, for Robert Johnson's talk. All right, I will. So I have more questions, but I think I, I can leave, you know, time to other people. Like... Can you show the slides with the three different vacua that you tried again? I was a bit fast. I want to see something. Um, on all right, sorry. There is one point I didn't emphasize as well as I should have, but. Um, you know. So you can share screen, right? Yes. Perfect. Uh, okay, so oh three back what? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the point I forgot to emphasize was in the Harlow Hawking and Unruh case, um, if you run a Bergoglio-Bolf transformation, you see that um, as you cross the event horizon, there should be a vacuum. Well, if, you're, if you have zero velocity at least. Yeah, so my question was also, was actually, uh, I, I'm going to ask, I was going to about the Bulwark case. So the, the Bulwark case uh, is uh, singular at the horizon, um, and uh, you have an asymptote in the response. That's super interesting, super curious. Oh, uh, well, I, I, um, as you can see, yeah. the Bulwark case, we the, the curve ends here. That's oh, because you that's don't, where... okay. Yeah, my bad. I was Sorry, actually, I, yeah. no, 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 it was my interpretation. So it does blow, blow up, right, uh, at the horizon. Well, I mean, we didn't attempt to calculate that, but right. as you can see, as you approach the horizon, the response isn't blowing up. It's actually decreasing. Oh, it's not. It's actually going down. Yes. So then it blow up, though? What do you think your intuition would be like? And the intuition would be, I mean, Mark has a question. I don't know if this is it about what we're talking about, Mark? Um, yes, ish. <laughs> then go ahead. Yes, please. Well, no, I mean, I was curious also about the bowler. I mean, certainly phi squared, uh, even phi oh. squared renormalized would blow up. Of course, that's not the that's same. Right. I would expect but the detector to read that divergence in the two-point function. Well, um, according, to, according to, there was this paper by Yorma that this entire project was inspired by uh, regarding the one plus one event uh, firewall. It turns out that um, even if there's an infinity, sometimes if your detector is set up right, your detector can still get a finite response as it passes through. We actually yeah, did expect great. something. We might expect something similar to happen here, but of course, we don't have a, full, a valid field extension for the boolware, so we don't know. But, but even even so, if you cross a Rindler firewall, there's a little kick. Uh, even when you cross, this this going down with uh, close to the horizon is surprising, definitely. Well, but we haven't actually touched the horizon yet, of course. Fair enough. Yeah. Oh, I. Sorry, I, I did. So yeah. Um, Hartle Hawking, Unruh, there's a, there's a vacuum near the horizon, but if you're at finite velocity, the, the papers I mentioned shows there is a small amount of radiation you see. So M Mark, uh, you still? Yeah. Right. No, I mean, I have little questions about this. I mean, now that I just look at the plots closely, it looks a little kinky just before, certainly the orange line, just before the, the peak, it doesn't. Uh, where? Just, just, uh, just outside the horizon. Yeah, just around there. It looks a little kinky, but anyway. Well, we had limited, like, for technical reasons, we couldn't produce. We had, we had to choose how many points we picked, so th there could it could just be a lack of sampling data there. Yeah. So my question was was so I was wondering about the L sum that you were alluding to, alluding to. Yes. Um, what what sort of L what sort of convergence do you get in the LSUM? Um, I, I don't I don't think I have the details listed in the main presentation. Um, ah, here we go. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, can I see? Well, uh, the graph is a bit of a mess, but well, they the, don't look the, like uh, they're converging really fast, no? Right. The convergence isn't fast. We so we did have to take a rather large number of L's to guarantee the there was convergence. But we did we did find that 
the the number of L's we took should have been sufficient to suppress any anomaly due to that. But did you do you know if it's polynomial, exponential? Um, I don't think we did that type of regression exactly, but I believe the decay should be polynomial. Okay. Um, just a comment. Just a comment. I don't know if this would apply here, but there is an analysis by Candelas in 1980 where he manages to do the L sums. Now that's for phi squared. It's not your case, but I think it might apply. I think you might tweak it in a way that it applies. So this is just to get it analytically on the event horizon. Mm, um, it, of course, the other challenge would be that we have a finite velocity at the event horizon, uh, whatever that means. Right. But you see, the L sum is independent of the, I don't think the detector affects the L sum at all. I think you okay, affect okay. the omega integral, but not the L sum. So it's not quite the same, but I think you could do the L sum first analytically on the horizon using Candela's tricks. Um, I, then, I, I, I hope that this Candela's trick would work slightly uh, uh, slightly outside the horizon too. It's asymptotic no. at the horizon, but okay. it's not, uh, how far it will depend on your case, yeah. All right. 